Yeah, we heard, uh, my name is Hisham Shahab. I came to this great, great country uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, I used to try to break the ice by saying, Hisham Shahab sounds like sushi, you know. And then I was giving a lecture at Fort Wayne to the seminary students and uh, uh, the professor took me to lunch and when we came back he forgot my last name but he knew I am from Lebanon. So he told them, please welcome Mr. Hisham Shish Kebab. <laughs> so that's really the best joke ever about my name. And uh, so uh, we heard that uh, uh, the great words of Jesus before he was lifted up to heaven. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all what I have commanded you, and behold, I'll be with you till the end of times. We call that the Great Commission, right? But for some of us, it has become a great recommendation. We kind of... Uh, uh, share the gospel with people who look like us, maybe those who love the same football team we love, you know. And we forget that uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the first church was founded, and the day of Pentecost, uh, you know, uh, after uh, Jesus was lifted up to heaven, the, the, the disciples were celebrating one of the Jewish festivals when the Holy Spirit fell on them. And there were people, you know, from all nations coming to Jerusalem for that Jewish event. And there were, uh, as chapter 2 in the book of Acts tells us, it singles out 15 people from different uh, regions. You have people who are called Medes. Medes today are Iraqis and Kurds with a K, North Iraq. There, are, there were uh, Persians, okay, from Iran it means, okay. Uh, Parthians, they called them. There were people, Arabs, there were Arabs, there were Greeks, there were people from Cyrene. Where did we hear that, Cyrene? Cyrene means uh, Tunisia and Libya today. Simon of Cyrene carried Jesus' cross on Calvary. A North African carried Jesus' cross on Calvary, see? So, uh, Jesus came to save all, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Die, uh, Christ died for you. He died for Saddam Hussein. He died for bin Laden. He died for, for Donald Trump, what have you. For all, you. You know, sometimes because of our traditions and the pictures we have, we think that Jesus was Norwegian or German, not a Jew who walked the streets of the Holy Land. So... Sometimes we are selective in our, you know, sharing the gospel. You know, uh, talking about races and ethnicities, I remember an, uh, something, an incident when I first moved from Michigan to uh, Chicagoland. I, uh, I was trying to drive to uh, University of Chicago on the south side, and I was lost in traffic, and uh, I asked a guy, a a walking by, uh, where is the University of Chicago? He said, pull over and I'll show you where to go. I thought he's going to mug me. I kept driving, I got to a McDonald's, and so I parked in and went in, I saw a man reading a book, and I thought that's a sign of a civilized man on the south side of Chicago, you know. You've heard about stories over there, right? Every... I mean, every uh, weekend, five people, ten people are shot or killed, you know. It's uh, sometimes uh, people die there, the number of people who die there more than Lebanon or Gaza, you know, right? So uh, I went into the McDonald's and the, the, a guy was reading a book, so I asked him about directions. He said, you could have just uh, kept driving and you hit campus. And I realized that first guy was going to mug me for sure then. And, uh, and I saw that he, the cover some, had something about religion. I asked him, sir, so what do you do for a living? He said, I am a professor of religious studies at the University of Chicago. Wow, okay. I took out my business card and gave it to him. 
He said, Arab Lutheran, he read, Arab Lutheran, this is an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms. He said, you are not Swede, you're not German, you know. And uh, so I had to tell him the good old story. I was, uh, uh, in 2001, I came from a trip to Switzerland. Uh, I, I traveled the world as a lecturer on Islam and uh, Middle Eastern studies and shared my story as well. So I, I, I was coming from, I traveled from Australia to the United States, actually, to Europe, what have you. I was coming from a trip to Switzerland when I, uh, uh, there, is, there was a lot of, you know, Switzerland is, is expensive, you know. So McDonald's there was 19 francs before the euro. 19 francs is maybe $25, you know, so the, the burger. So I came back to pay the credit card, uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, in the elevator of the bank, I bumped into a retired Lutheran pastor from northern Minnesota, Bernie Lutz, who was 66 years old. Bernie promised his wife when they retire, he'll take her south. So he took her to Lebanon, you know. And uh, so uh, there he wanted to revive the Lutheran Hour ministry. Okay, I have many stories you haven't heard. Uh, this means come back, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 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 Bernie Lutz came to revive the Lutheran Hour ministry. The office was destroyed in the civil war that raged between 1975 and 1989. And uh, so it was 2001, April 2001. I was going into that back building the, and the elevator. Bernie Lutz took his uh, car, business card, was t giving, up to, giving the business card to the people around. It was a huge elevator. And he was trying to say, God is love in Arabic. In Arabic, God is love is Allah mahabba. He went, habla, 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 habla. <laughs> habla means stupid in Arabic. So I laughed and took his card and saw Middle Eastern Lutheran ministry or something like that. I thought, well, this uh, Lutheran can speak about the Reformation and Martin Luther better than me. Maybe I should invite him to speak in my class, you know. And... Uh, I called him and he was so excited that he, he said, we need to have coffee right now. Come. So I walked to his apartment after that, you know, and we were having coffee. And he said, uh, Mr. Hisham, can you help me? I, I don't really know Arabic. Uh, and uh, everybody who came to my office wanted a visa to the U.S., you know. And uh, maybe you can help me with, with you're a local boy, etc. So... Uh, so I helped him for three years, you know, and uh, after that he invited me to come to Seminary Fort Wayne, Indiana. You know, Bernie Lutz, uh, when he went to the holy city, uh, which is St. Louis, I mean, you know, to ask for, to go, to, uh, told them, I want to go to Lebanon to share the gospel with Muslims. He said, they told him, why to go to Lebanon? There are, half of the country is Christian in Lebanon. Half of the population is Christian. Let the Christian Arabs share the gospel with the Muslim Arabs. But uh, the, the Arab uh, Christians in Lebanon were kind of very selective about the Great Commission. They thought Jesus, Jesus there is theirs. They thought Muslims are barbarian. And uh, so I was born in 1960 in that beautiful country. It was the Switzerland of the Middle East. Uh, Beirut, Lebanon, in a Sunni Muslim family, and I, uh, instead of sharing the gospel, you know, with us, they killed my only brother, my only sibling, you know. We were in a civil war. I was 15 years old uh, when I was recruited by the Muslim Brotherhood militia, and uh, the civil war was very ugly, and we were kind of, uh, I, uh, I used to climb on go to high-rise buildings and uh, snipe at Christian neighborhoods with my brother as well. And, uh, and uh, they were very, very hard days. But the Muslim Brotherhood saw in me a man who, or a, a young man who could be in the future one of their leaders because I recited the Quran very well, the Book of Islam. Later, I memorized my, more than half of the Quran by heart. And I got the gab, as they say in American English. I, I speak very well, etc. They thought, 
in Arabic, not yet English. So they uh, asked me if I would like to be trained to become one of their leaders in the future. I come from a family that's five, we were 5,000 voters when I left Beirut in 20 years ago. Now there are more. Well, the family, they, I have more than a hundred first cousins, you know. And uh, so Lebanon is a, a country, a special country where Christians were 50% of the country when it was established. And the Christians liked the French because the French helped them get to power. And Lebanon is the only country where you have a Christian president, a commander-in-chief, you know. Uh, and it's the only country where you have a former president who's alive, you know. Because, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but the, the Christians, Lebanon, loved the French, want to be Western, like the West. So they had one kid and a dog while the Muslims had 10 kids. With a few decades, in a few decades, uh, uh, Muslims outnumbered them and started to ask for political, more political power, which they're right. Uh, but uh, a civil war broke out over that, you know, uh, just explaining the background here. So the Muslim Brotherhood told me, you know, kind of, uh, you could be one of our leaders because I'm, I come from a good family, you know, and they said, uh, we'll train you. In six months, they were able to microwave me into a preacher. At the age of 16, I was ready to give my first Friday, you know, uh, message. And I had it memorized, you know, in, in, in Arabic in the Middle East, you cannot really preach from notes. You have to really memorize it and interact with people. And in some mosque where the imams are very outgoing, the first row would be spattered with saliva. Okay? So, so, so I memorized everything and I was ready to go, but God had a different plan for my life. I got into a head-on collision, broke both legs. I was hospitalized at the American University Hospital for 50 days, bedridden for one year. I couldn't even walk on crutches. I admired the doctors and nurses at the American University Hospital. It was affiliated with the American University of Beirut, founded in 1867, the Harvard of the Middle East. And I was excited about medicine. I thought maybe a medical doctor better than a preacher. At least you make more money, you know. Uh, so uh, I uh, decided to teach myself more English. I started uh, teaching myself English by reading comic books, Snoopy and, uh, you know, Charlie and uh, Tar Tarzan and Superman and Batman, what have you. By the year 1980, I sat for an exam, English exam at the American University of Beirut and passed with flying colors. I was admitted to the pre-medical program, but again, I want to focus on my studies. I thought this is a dream come true. I was the first in my extended family to make it to the American University of Beirut. Because as I told you, it's the Harvard in the Middle East. And uh, I want to focus on my studies, but again, God had a different plan for my life. My only brother, my only sibling was killed that semester, 1980. I was 20, he was 22. I was devastated, he was my only friend, my only sibling. I was a bookworm, I didn't have friends, uh, you know. And I decided, uh, I was full of hate. I got a silencer and a gun and decided to kill my enemies. You know, they were dark days, but God, again, had a different plan for my life. Uh, I couldn't focus on my studies completely because I was derailed by, with uh, the death of my brother. My mother died three years before him. And, uh, and I thought I could make friends with some of my classmates who were Christians who belonged to that militia in order to ambush them easier. One of them was Druze too. You mentioned Druze, yeah. So I thought, Maybe I could make friends with them in order to know where they live, how they move at night in order to ambush them. Again, God had a different plan for my life because I signed up for a course of cultural studies, a course of cultural studies that included uh, uh, comparative studies from uh, Greek mythology, uh, 
selections from the Old Testament, selections from the New Testament, selections from the Quran, the Book of Islam, all in English. Selections, selections from Western philosophy, from uh, Socrates to Nietzsche. So one day I came back uh, from a night of uh, stalking my enemies to the classroom in the morning to hear something that would change my life forever. I heard a selection from the Sermon on the Mount, Love Your Enemies. The professor was quoting the Sermon on the Mount, Love Your Enemies, Pray for Those Who Persecute You. I thought, well, I mean, who could love his enemies? Who could turn the other cheek? I, Jesus mentioned the Quran, uh, Jesus in the Quran has more miracles than the New Testament. But you don't have the teachings of Jesus in the Quran, you know. And he is really... Uh, 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 not promoted, demoted to a prophet only. And I thought, this is really ridiculous. Who could turn the other cheek? The next day, she, the professor came and she quoted uh, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked by the, uh, the Pharisees, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I thought to myself, I am a devout Muslim who goes to the mosque at dawn. I used to be very devout that he used to pray at the mosque five prayers, dawn, noon, afternoon, sunset, evening, you know. And uh, if you think it's a big deal to come to church Sunday morning, think about waking up at 4.30 in the morning, having ablutions, you know, wash, and, and go to the mosque even in the cold and pitch dark nights of the civil war, you know. I thought, Muslims are trying to love God more than anybody else. This is what we do. We are ready to die for Allah and a jihad. But this Jesus Christ is overdoing it. Who could love God with all his heart and with all his soul, with all his mind, you know. I should really look into it. I got a Bible and started reading on my own you know, and the more I read, the more I felt peace and the need for forgiveness. But I thought maybe the truth is not in the Bible. Maybe it's not in the Quran, the book of Islam. Maybe it's not, uh, you know, anywhere. Maybe it's in Eastern philosophy, you know. And I thought maybe I should really look for a Hindu temple or a Buddhist temple. In 1980-81, there was no temple, Hindu or Buddhist temples in Beirut, Lebanon. The only thing I could find close was a yoga course at the American University of Beirut offered by a British instructor. I'm trying to wake you up. A British instructor who, uh, who was a disciple of the great Mahatma Gandhi. So I signed up for a course and uh, I walked into the classroom. I was a young muscular guy. I like uh, pastor here, but did bodybuilding and uh, I did three martial arts, uh, Korean, Taekwondo, and two Chinese martial arts, and I was jogging five miles a day, you know. So I walked into the classroom and the, the instructor said, uh, sir, did you come here by mistake because all the students were ladies, because yoga for in 1980, 81 was for women only in Beirut, no, no, no. Not, uh, men did not fit, think that's fit for them. So I said, no, I really signed up for the course. She said, so why? You, you look really good. I said, well, I want to see if I can reach God through Eastern spirituality. She said, wow, this is the first time somebody comes for the right reason, you know, to, to take yoga, you know. I said, Go, good. But she said, if you want to excel in yoga, you have to be vegetarian, you know. Well, as I said, I was doing three martial arts, somebody building and uh, jogging five miles a day, and I have to munch on fruits and vegetables half of the day and spend the other half of the day in the bathroom because of the fibers, you know. But uh, in two months, I excelled in yoga and I was able to stand on my head and hold my toes behind my back and put my feet behind my head anymore, not anymore, okay, my feet behind my head. She said, you are the most serious yoga student I have ever seen. You can start with transcendental meditation. I was given a mantra, a Sanskrit word that uh, 
like if you remember David Carradine and his Om. And I was supposed to say that mantra repeated thousands of times. I was told that mantra, uh, it will carry you up to the Creator, Brahma, whatever. In seven steps, the last one is called Samadhi in Sanskrit. means union with, well, you know, actually yoga also means union. So the more I repeated the mant- that mantra a thousand times, the more I felt that I'm not climbing up to God, I'm going down in my filth. And it dawned on me, you may think or try to reach God through spirituality, you know. You may think you can reach God through your good works, but it's an upside down story. In Jesus Christ, the Word of God came down to us and became flesh. The Word of God, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us and died on the cross for our salvation and rose from the dead. And God gave me peace beyond human understanding. Peace that made me forgive my enemies. Before I finished Samaria, when I came to Chicagoland, I was giving a food basket to, uh, to refugees in Wheaton and Glen Allen when I bumped into a Palestinian refugee who was born in Lebanon and married to an Iraqi. And uh, she wanted more food because she had five kids, and I asked her, uh, can I, I gave her three baskets, three boxes, and I asked her, can I come have tea with you and uh, with my wife? She said, sure. So I went there, and uh, after two weeks, we were sitting there having tea. I saw all neighbors come in, Iranians, Iraqis, Palestinians. I asked her, can I have a Bible study in your apartment here? She said, yes, you teach, I'll do lunch for them. So I started that, and uh, in two weeks, we baptized seven people from Iran and Iraq. And uh, then we moved to, to, to a church because we were uh, increasing in numbers. And, uh, and uh, now we have baptized more than 50 people. And I have another um, uh, mission society called Messiah for Muslims where we send people to seminary. We have sent and ordained two people so far, one now is in California, one in... Uh, we are working with one Iraqi guy who, who came to Chicagoland, you know, I have to tell his story because that's Messiah for Muslim, uh, came to Chicagoland from, uh, uh, from Iraq, he was a Muslim leader in Baghdad and when rises uh, in charge of four mosques, when ISIS rose to power, he kind of uh, 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 sent his bodyguards to protect his uh, Christian neighbors who were persecuted by ISIS. ISIS didn't like it. They booby-trapped his car, and uh, when he started his car in the morning, it exploded, and he found himself after... He woke up from coma in the hospital after days and saw that he almost lost his left leg and other things. And uh, his left leg was shriveled, gangrened, and was scheduled for amputation and in Baghdad, okay? And uh, Peter, let me call him Peter. Peter cried to Allah, Allah, I have served you 50 years of my life. Can't you save my left leg? A disabled man in Iraq is nothing, you know? Instead of Allah, Jesus showed up at night and told Peter, I am Jesus Christ, I can save you if you follow me. Jesus tapped his leg with his stick. I think that's the stick that Moses used to throw and become a, a, uh, a snake. And in the morning, that shriveled leg started to have blood flowing and uh, became rosy. And the doctors came and said, this is a miracle. And they canceled the amputation. Uh, Isis kidnapped his daughter and he ransomed her back and uh, he went to Jordan, lost everything, all his money and what have you, and um, he made it to Chicago land through a miracle three months ago where I have been taking care of him. We baptized him uh, uh, end of July actually. Peter and his family are here now. I'm taking care of them and we want to send him to seminary. 
And this is one of the stories. You know, uh, Muslims are seeing Jesus in visions and dreams and coming to church to ask about the Word of God. You cannot be saved by a vision or a dream, but by the Word of God. And Jesus is doing the work. We are not doing the work. And when he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, he did not stop there. What did he say? I'll be with you till the end of times. If you surrender to Jesus, he'll use you as an instrument, as a tool in his hand, you know, to reach the nations. And I would wrap with the doxology that uh, St. Peter, St. Paul had in Ephesians 3. Because this is really always, for me, very impress impressive. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. In some translations it says, Now to him who is able to do far more than we can imagine. More than we, we can imagine because of the Holy Spirit working within us. Amen? May the Lord of hope fill you with joy and peace, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope and boldness and reach the lost. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Hisham. You get the sense as you listen to Hisham that uh, he's got uh, all sorts of stories to be able to tell. And um, the man he calls Peter, I had a chance to meet with and pray over actually shortly after he came here from the United States. And so I heard from him the story of Jesus and the dream and the healing of his leg. And it's really powerful to hear stories of how God is still present and active, moving to win back for himself as many as he can, girls and boys and women and men, uh, from the Muslim uh, communities, from uh, Christian communities, from every community in the world, every tribe, nature, and tongue. Uh, that's what God wants as part of his kingdom for forever. So thank you, Hisham.